Welcome Soko family and to all my Christian uh, family. Peace and Christ blessing to all. So recently uh, there's been a few videos from Shamsi uh, regarding myself. The last one he said that I refuted the Bible by saying it was corrupted and that it, there were parts in it that weren't the word of God. This is actually a, a misconception in terms of what I actually said. So I'm going to go through some of the responses Shamsi made in regard to the second video, the second debate I had with him where we were discussing the prophethood of Muhammad and to clarify exactly why Muhammad was a false prophet and uh, what the criteria for prophethood was. This is not a, a personal attack on Shamsi. I'm going to critique some of the things he said because this is Speaker's Corner where we come to debate, discuss, engage and dissect what people say. And sometimes Shamsi is someone, yes, he knows a lot about what he talks about, but I think even he misrepresents some of the things that he says. I hopefully I'll clarify some of those points in this uh, discussion. The first thing, was last week there was a video um, we can see Paperboy admits the Bible has corruption uh, this was last week so I was talking to him about um, Deuteronomy 34 he asked me about who wrote that first of all we can see that it talks about Moses in the third person where it says there was no other prophet like him so I'm just going to quickly play the video and we'll just see the bit that he thinks that I actually admitted the Bible was corrupted. And the people of Israel cried for him. Yes. And since then, yes. there will be no prophet like Moses. Who's speaking here? I believe that was the scribe that had huh? I believe it was the scribe that had it. Ah, this was, so, so, that piece must be gone. That piece, piece. Hey, 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 that's a good one. So, uh, if it's added, why is it it's corruption? Because you add something, it's not from God. So that bit was not from God. From God. Okay, yeah. So, in terms of... Well, I can't so in terms of when I debate, sometimes I say, okay, yeah, a lot of the time. So then for Shamsi, that was confirmation of me admitting that the Bible had been corrupted, but this was not actually the case. In terms of when I was talking about um, scribes, uh, some say that it was Joshua who could have added it. Uh, me personally, I think it, would have, it could have been Ezra when the Bible was uh, fully um, canonized. So this was perfectly well within uh, Jewish tradition to um, con conclude the narrative of the, uh, the Torah. So what Muslims will claim is that the Torah was given to Moses by, um, by God. In the Quran it talks about Allah written on tablets, but this is not the case with uh, Christianity or Judaism. That uh, God recited the, co the commandments and the pre-creation of from the creation onwards and then Moses was writing over 40 years the Torah um, so what we have is just a conclusion to uh, the narrative which was befitting of him which would have been inspired by God so what Shamsi is trying to conflate is that if this was added then uh, it means that the Bible has been corrupted but this is conflating two different things because what he's trying to say is that this then makes the Bible unreliable and who wrote the, the Torah but actually if we go on to uh, Jewish this is a Jewish website uh, this is in the Mishnah so we clearly see Moshe received the Torah from Sinai and transmitted it to Yehoshua and to Yehoshua, to the elders, and to the elders, to the prophets, and to the prophets transmitted to the great men of the assembly. This is where uh, Ezra was one of the great men of the assembly. And they said three things. So clearly in the Mishnah, we have the transmission of the Torah and the, uh, the whole Tanakh from Moses all the way to uh, Gigamel. And Gigamel was the uh, teacher of Saul uh, or Paul. So we clearly have what Muslim would call an isna. We can see very clearly from Jewish tradition that how it was transmitted. Now, what Shamsi is trying to do in, in mischaracterizing this argument is to say that if something has been added, then therefore the whole text or the whole Torah cannot be trust, trustworthy. And this is a very false uh, straw man argument. Uh, and funnily enough, in their video, 
they say they used this verse which says so because of their breach of their covenant we cursed them and made their hearts grow hard they changed the words from their right places and have abandoned a good part of the message so according to Shamsi's definition of corruption it's when you move words from their places that is the definition he uses as corruption not my definition but his but then let's go to the Quran surah 5 verse 3 and it says forbidden to you the flesh of swine and the meat of that which has been slaughtered as a sacrifice for others than Allah or has been slaughtered for idols or which Allah's name has not mentioned while staggering while slaughtering and that which has been killed by strangling or by a violent blow or by a headlong fall or by the goring of horns and that which has been partly eaten by a wild animal unless you are able to slaughter it before its death and that which is sacrificed on al nusab forbidden also is to use arrows seeking luck or decision all that is fisquin uh, disobedience of Allah and sin and then it says this day those who disbelieve have given up all hope of your religion so fear them not but fear me this day I have perfected your religion for you completed my favor upon you and have chosen for you Islam as your religion but for him who is forced by severe hunger with no inclination sin then surely Allah is oft forgiven most merciful what we notice here is basically a di the dietary laws and then for some reason Allah says for this day your religion is perfected so imagine guys if I go to a pizza hut and I say to them what kind of pizzas do you have and they say we have pepperoni we have margarita we have Hawaiian have you been in a car accident recently or have you been missold PPI oh and we also have mighty meaty and then we have burgers you'd feel discombobulated you think where did this come from so how do we have dietary laws and then midway through Allah says today your religion has been perfected for you this is in surah 5 3 so then does this mean we reject all the other 109 surahs because in chapter 5 it's saying your religion is perfect so therefore we disregard the rest of the Quran or we logically conclude that this verse should have been in the very last chapter of the Quran so according to Shamsi's definition words that have been misplaced this has been misplaced as well so therefore by Shamsi's definition the Quran is corrupted because clearly and this is not my verse he posted we can clearly hear change the words from their right places so then we have to consider well by Shamsi's uh, definition the Quran is corrupted so then also I wanted to establish the fact that he talks about um, in uh, the previous discussion with him he's talked about Jesus I mentioned Jesus confirming what was in between his hands and Shamsi said that this means what was before and I'm going to show you uh, something very uh, intellectually um, dishonest if we go to surah 33 3, it clearly says he has sent down upon you O Muhammad the book in truth confirming what was before it and he refilled the Torah and the gospel and notice how the Sahih International it says uh, confirming what was before but funnily enough if we go to actual the Arabic it says between 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 so this was literally physically what was in between his hands but Shamsi is saying he was affirming what was before and we see from the corruption of this translation that they've used the word before but here when we look at the Arabic word it says between every time it's used because Jesus literally confirmed what was in between his hands and he had the Torah and if we have the Dead Sea Scrolls which predate Jesus then the question is for not us Christians to prove who wrote it but for Shamsi to prove which uh, Torah did Jesus have in his hands because clearly we see and the Arabic is very clear and even um, I have another uh, a Quran and this 3-3 th three, three, says he has been sending down upon you the book with the truth sincerely verifying what was before it and what did they put 
literally between its two hands. And then he sent down the Torah, the book revealed to Moses and the Injil. So clearly Jesus was confirming what was in between his hand. And uh, Muhammad did the same thing because we see the verse where uh, about the stoning and the adultery where Muhammad confirmed what was between his hand as well and when he judged the Jews about what was in the Torah he took the uh, cushion that he was sitting on and he put the Torah on it now the question would be why if a book was corrupted would you put a cushion on it you'd put it in the bin you wouldn't say I believe in thee because uh, Muhammad literally confirmed what was in between his hands as well so then this is an uh, a tactic of the Islamic Dawah team and as I said it's not a personal attack but on Shamsi or anything but it's a distortion of the facts because what is clearly being said is that he was confirming what was before it so the, the, the what the Islamic Dawah team need to do is to confirm which manuscript did Jesus and Muhammad had because we have all the manuscripts possible so if there was a alternative then they need to prove it to us which they clearly can't uh, clear and obviously before the discussion before we talked about prophethood and um, whether Muhammad was a prophet and this is like a very important topic so first of all we want to know in terms of Muhammad being poisoned did it really lead to his his death so it says it was narrated from Ibn Abbas that a Jewish woman gave the messenger of Allah some poisoned mutton he sent word to her asking what made you do what you did she said I wanted uh, I wanted if you were a prophet that Allah would tell you about it and if you were not a prophet then I would have rid you of the, rid the people of you when the messenger of Allah felt that any pain because of that he would be treated with cupping on one occasion he traveled and when he entered Iran he felt some pain because of what was and was treated with cupping so just to kind of further expound on this so we clearly see this hadith from Bukhari authentic says when Kaibar was conquered a cooked sheep containing poison was given as a present to Allah's apostle so this is what we're confirming in the hadith before and then we clearly say see again the woman said if you were a prophet it would not harm you but if you were king I should rid the people of you so clearly this is a Jewish woman um, going on uh, kind of Jewish tradition in terms of establishing a prophet because we clearly know that poison and magic should not work on a prophet so then what we see next is uh, if we go into the prophetic uh, book of medicine because the thing is what we need to learn know is that um, Allah constantly spoke about uh, his prophets being protected so clearly it says when the prophet used cupping, used cupping he did it in the upper part of the back which is the most direct route to the heart and so the poison was extracted with the blood and in this case only partially a part of the poison remained in the prophet's system in order to fulfill what had Allah decided for his prophet so he would acquire every type of good and righteous reward there is then it says so when Allah decided that it was time for his prophet to die as a martyr the effect of the poison reappeared so obviously this is Islamic tradition trying to kind of reconciliate that uh, you know Muhammad was poisoned and killed clearly you know this was a historical fact the woman poisoned him and he died from it but now we see traditions trying to kind of say uh, Allah allowed so and so to happen you know but one of the funny things is you know if we look in in terms of numbers we see that prophets are clearly um, protected under from God so we have to ask well if the woman said these words will affect you and they will cause your demise why Allah allowed it because when we clearly see in the Bible God never allowed false accusations be, to be levied on prophets because otherwise it would make the person look like a false God so I just wanted to kind of go through some of the, the um, the Islamic traditions and kind of we see in this one as well it says when Allah's messenger this is from Sahih Muslim this is when Allah's messenger fell ill Gabriel used to recite this in the name of Allah may he cure you from all kinds of illness and safeguard you from evil of a jealous one when he feels jealous and from the evil influence of eyes so clearly we have even angels praying for Muhammad but he's not being cured so firstly a prophet shouldn't have been affected in the first place 
and we've seen, uh, you know, we've seen Jibril praying for Mohammed, and it's clearly not a effect uh, working. And then what we see here is the most most relevant part of everything that I've just previously spoke about because it says the prophet in his ailment in which he died used to say oh Aisha I still feel the pain caused by the food I ate at Kaiba and at this time I feel as if my aorta is being cut from that poison so clearly listen to the words he said I feel as if my aorta is being cut from that poison but when we go into the Quran, chapter 63, verse 44 to 47, it says, And if Muhammad had made up about us some false sayings, and if he had forgot, forged the discourse and thereafter described it to us, we would have seized him. It says, we would, we would have seized him by the right hand. We would have surely seized him by the right hand. And we would have cut him from the aorta. <laughs> Notice Allah is saying if a prophet makes falsehoods against him, he will cut off his aorta. And funny enough, Muhammad also said he feels as if his aorta has been cut. Now, the reason why this is relevant is if we go to the Bible, it says, But if a prophet who presumes to speak in my name, anything I have not commanded, or a prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, is to be put to death. So now Shamsi asked me how if someone comes in the name of God can prophesize then how do we d distinguish he's a true prophet now it was a very good question because after um, Christ Paul gave us the criteria that if anyone speaks a gospel other than Christ they are a false prophet so this is what we go by now but to the Israelites this is what Deuteronomy was talking about now Imagine if a prophet came in this name, how would the, the prophets distinguish a true and false prophet? Well, God gives us the answer. If there arise amongst you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and giveth thee a sign or wonder, and if the sign or wonder come to pass, whereof he spoke unto thee saying, let us go after other gods which thou hast not known and let us serve them, thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or the dreamer of dreams for the Lord your God proveth to you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and what your, with all your soul so clearly what this verse is talking about is that yes prophets can come with dreams visions uh, and things that can come to pass to fool the people but God is saying you know don't follow them because it will be a test and if you stick to the true God you know you'll do so because you love him and this is one of the reasons why um, God gave the name Yahweh to distinguish him from the other gods before his name was El but this is the most conclusive evidence as to why what would happen in terms of if a false prophet ha comes around, around we go to Jeremiah 14 1450 it says then the Lord said to me the prophets are prophesying lies in my name and I have not sent them or appointed them or spoken to them they are prophesying to you false visions, divinations, idolatries and the delusions of their own minds. Therefore this is what the Lord says about the prophets who are prophesying in my name. I did not send them, yet they are saying, no sword or famine will touch this land. Those same prophets will perish by the sword and the famine. So clearly what this verse is saying is the very things that the prophets will prophesize is the very same words God would destroy them by. But this is why if we look at, for example, in the book of Esther, you have the story of Mordecai and Esther and Haman, where Haman wanted to kill um, Mordecai using a pole to spear him on it. And what happened? Uh, Haman, in the end, was killed by this very same uh, uh, pole in the same story of Ahab and Jezebel. The false prophet says one thing and they were killed by the, that very same thing. So we see a tradition in the Bible that God will personally intervene in a situation. As we see in Jeremiah, he said the prophets will say no sword or famine will touch this land, but they were killed by famine and the sword. So clearly when we see in the Quran, Allah says, if you have spoken falsehoods about me, we will cut off your aorta. But then Muhammad said, I feel as if my aorta is being cut. Clearly, this is God revealing that this man had not uh, spoken prophet, uh, true prophecy in his words. Because the Muslims will say, oh, well, how do we know that um, it was a miracle that he survived uh, onwards? But the, 
there's a very good Islamic um, explanation of this. So if we go back to chapter 69, 44, and we look at the notes, it says, some foolish people draw the wrong and misleading conclusions from this verse by fallacious reasoning. They confine the meaning of fala to long life or worldly prosperity or worldly success and argue like this. This verse declares categorically that criminals can never attain success. This, the converse of this proposition is that anyone who successfully cannot be a criminal must also be true. Hence, if a claimant should live a long life after his claim to prophethood or prosper in this world or his claim receives a good response in the world from the people, he should be acknowledged as a true prophet for they argue if he had been a false prophet, he could not have prospered but would have been killed or starved to death or rendered unsuccessful in his mission as soon as he had claimed to be a prophet. But even a little thinking will show you that this argument is fallacious on the face of it. Firstly, the converse of every proposition is not always true. And then it goes on to say, a false prophet can continue prophesying and saying false things, but Allah will allow this to continue, to expose the, this person as a false prophet and destroy them by it. So this is clearly what we see with Muhammad. God allowed this person to continue to preach falsehoods. Uh, Allah's messenger never proceeded on the day of El Eid al fitr unless he had eaten some dates and that's also narrated the Prophet used to eat an odd number of dates. So clearly he's saying dates will not affect you. If you, if you eat dates you will not be affected by magic or poison and we clearly see that he used to eat an odd number of dates but clearly what has happened is he's been poisoned by the woman so this is a false prophecy and clearly he's been bewitched so it's like if you had been burgled what would the first thing you'd do after you saw out everything you'd install a burglary system right to protect yourself so if he has first been affected by magic uh, been affected by poison surely logical reasoning would say okay let me now on now from now take my own advice and eat agile dates but then clearly afterwards he's affected by magic so how did their magic affect him if he's clearly making a prophecy to say eating dates will not affect you so this is again when we go back to Jeremiah God will destroy false prophets by their very own words and clearly we see he's said attributed something to Allah about Allah saying his eye auto will be cut which he said his, he felt like his eye auto was being cut then we see him uh, being affected by poison which caused his death and then we clearly see a third instance that he has been affected by magic so how can all these three things be attrib attributed to a true prophet because this is clearly God acting in a way to clearly show that Muhammad was a false prophet um, just because we're losing light and I just wanted to show one other thing about the about Allah it says this is from Sahih Muslim it says Abu Ayyab Ansari reports that Allah's messenger said if you were not to commit sins Allah would have swept you out of existence and would have replaced you by another people who have committed sin and then asked forgiveness from Allah and he would have granted them pardon so why would Allah want people to commit sin because it's clearly saying if you were not to commit sins Allah would have swept you out of existence but God does not want us to commit sin we we uh, from obviously when we read the Bible from the fall of Adam and Eve is because they chose to disobey God's command and that's what sin was and God's always trying to get us away from sin but here we clearly see Allah wants you to sin so you can then ask him for his forgiveness and pardon you but this is what Satan does Satan wants you to sin God does not want you to sin because God is pure God cannot teach you to do something that is against his own nature and this is why God you know God cannot lie so he's not going to teach you to lie Black magic is an abomination to God, but clearly we see in the Quran Allah sent Haru and Maru to teach people black magic, the same black magic that affected Allah, um, affected Muhammad. And clearly we see here that you know Allah wants you to sin. So I'm not sure why any righteous God would want his own people to sin. You know, and hopefully maybe I'll do another series to kind of go through the verses more in depth because there was a lot to cover but this was just the basics so I would like you know Shamsi to respond to some of these comments and say you know whether you want to do it in a bait and we can discuss and you can answer me or if you want to make another video I'll make another video in response but 
we can clearly see when we go into Islamic literature, one, that the Torah is not corrupted, it's been confirmed, it's even confirmed within your own Islamic literature, Jesus confirmed what was in his hand. So again, I asked Shamsi to provide me evidence of uh, something that was different from what we have now because the Dead Sea Scrolls precede uh, Jesus. And we clearly see Muhammad making prophecies and he's been destroyed by these very same prophecies which God in Jeremiah says he will destroy prophets by their very own words. So this will be a conclusion of uh, today's discussion. It's getting a bit dark. Um, but I just wanted to refute the claims that Shanzi had made against me that I had confirmed that the Bible was corrupted, but it has not been corrupted. And, uh, you know, it will be down to now the Islamic Dawa team, Shamsi, to show us what was the Torah or the Gospels that these people had. Because we have every manuscript. So this is where we have to be very aware of the kind of twisting of facts. You know, when we go and check the facts, it's very different. Because people can sound knowledgeable, but when you go and check the sources, it paints a very different picture. So peace and love to all the family and stay strong in Christ. Jesus Christ is a God. Uh, Jesus is our God, our Lord, our Saviour. And we know from the Bible that God stands by his words. His words cannot be corrupted. And that even when false prophets came, God intervened and destroyed them with his own hand by their own words. So people could see that they were false prophets. And clearly this is what we see with Muhammad.